everyone, I'm Georgia and this is The Sound of Georgia. In today's video we're going to be talking about one specific adaptation of the Von Trapp story that you probably haven't heard about, and that is The Von Trapp Family, A Life of Music. Okay, yeah, if you watch some of my other videos you might have heard of it once or twice, but if there's one adaptation you haven't heard about, it could very well be this one. And that's because it's different. All the others were based off Maria's memoir, this one is not. This movie is based off Agatha Von Trapp's memoir, Memories Before and After the Sound of Music. Agatha was the oldest daughter, so her Sound of Music analogue, I guess, would be lethal. But I made a whole video a few weeks back about how the names changed and who really was who. Click the card. And so that's what makes this adaptation different. Because this time it's not Maria's story. But the reason I think it's really interesting and want to talk about it is because in a lot of ways I think it is the most faithful adaptation of the Von Trapp story and the least faithful at the same time. And when I say faithful, be that most faithful or least faithful, I mean to history, I mean to reality. I don't mean to the source material because as far as resembling the memoir this doesn't. This movie does not resemble the memoir at all. Sound of Music and Maria's memoir are a lot more similar than Agatha's memoir and this film. And you don't have to be a viewer of this channel or a crazy fangirl like me to know that Rogers and Hammerstein changed a lot. When I watch this movie I have a running commentary in my head in a way that I have never had with any other movie ever. It's really kind of amusing. But let's just get into talking about it. And we're going to start with the good bits. So this is what I think makes it the most faithful. Number one, the timeline and time compression, or in this case lack thereof. This counts for a lot people. In real life there were 11 years between Maria arriving and marrying the captain and their escape, and every adaptation condenses that time period, but this one does it the least. All the other adaptations condense it into 18 months usually, or in Sound of Music's case, a summer, roughly. <laughs> yeah, Sound of Music is a lot quicker than even any of the others. This one does compress the timeline, but a lot, lot less. This film slices three years off at the beginning, but that's it. So all that happens in this version is that Maria arrives three years later than she did in reality. Everything else regarding the timeline is historically accurate. The plot well, we'll get to that. I can't really say too much about the other kids, not just because it's Agatha's story, but they're actually not that big a part of it. If you look at the credits at the end or check IMDb, you can see they're all credited as the correct people, but they're not really mentioned at all. Rupert's mentioned by name once or twice, and maybe one of the other children, but other than that, nothing. I've said it before, but I think with Sound of Music and, well, the German film and the anime, the children really are one seven-part character, rather than seven individual characters. Yes, Liesl included, but with this story being Agatha's, not Maria's, that is very different, obviously. This time we've got one character and the others are really little more than background noise, honestly. But even if they are just bit parts, essentially, with the timeline of what it is, we do actually get to see Maria's two girls. We don't get to see Johan, but Johan wouldn't have been born at that time. But we do get to see Rosemary and Eleanor. The next thing I think this has that makes it more faithful than any of the others is the aesthetic, the look. This film looks so much closer to reality than any of the others do. This is Maria in reality, this is Maria in the movie. This is Georg in reality, this is Georg in the movie. Yeah, some of the actors they got to play the kids are blonde when, well, none of them were blonde, and Agatha herself honestly doesn't look all that much like Eliza Bennet, who plays her in the movie, but overall the aesthetic is perfect as far as I'm concerned. Even if they're not strictly the main characters in this movie, Maria and Gail look perfect. And this is the reason this movie won on the video where I ranked Maria's wedding dresses. <laughs> this is why this movie beat out Sound of Music, because of just how close it got to reality. And 
I understand that aesthetic doesn't really seem like it would be the biggest deal when it comes to faithfulness. But when every other version of our matriarch always looks like this, it is quite refreshing to see something that looks closer. And for once they're all always wearing dirndls and lederhosen. None of the others really do that. It is really refreshing to see something that looks this close. So they're the two big things I think this movie gets better than any other adaptation out there. And personally, I think those two really count for something. So now I'm going to move on to the things that I think make it the least faithful adaptation. Honestly, most of these are just little details, but the reason I put them on this list is because as little details, all the other adaptations got closer. Yes, even Sound of Music some of the time. And honestly, I just think it's kind of bizarre that they changed these details the way they did. Like in all the other adaptations and reality, there is a Nazi hiding with them. But he's not the butler, as he is in every other version and really was. He's the chauffeur. And the fact that he's a Nazi is revealed a lot earlier and it doesn't seem to be nearly as big a deal. So, okay, for those who aren't aware, and by that I really mean if you only know the sound of music, not long after Maria and the Captain married, they went completely bankrupt. And because of that, they were forced to let the staff go, pay lower wages, take in boarders, start a chapel, and that is eventually how they met Father Franz Wasner, who became their conductor agent person when they formed this new group. Father Franz Wasner is nowhere to be seen in this movie. And kind of like with the butler, sorry, chauffeur, the fact that they go bankrupt isn't really that big a deal. It seemed right after they find out they've gone bankrupt and it's between Maria, Georg, Agatha and Rupert and they're all trying to work out what are they going to do and the only thing they talk about doing and we actually see them do is letting some of the staff go. Remember how I said I had that commentary? When I'm watching this bit I'm going and anything else? Nope, okay good. And yes I can understand why you would want to change those sort of things around, particularly that bit about the bankruptcy, because this isn't the same story as all the other adaptations. This is not Maria's story, it's Agatha's. Which is where the biggest least faithful point comes in. It's entirely fictional. Despite those little details, everything in the background, for lack of a better word, everything that goes on with the family is very, very close to what really happened. But unlike all the others, the focus isn't on the family. It's on Agatha. So what happens with the family is, I wouldn't exactly call it a subplot, but it's not the main plot. It's in the background. The focus is on Agatha and everything to do with Agatha is fictional. The movie covers a third of this memoir, but as I said at the beginning, the plot's very different. Really, it covers the timeline of a third of the memoir. Before I saw it, I thought maybe part of it would be set after they got to America. But nope, it ends with the escape, just like all the others. Well, and there's the framing device, but we're not going to worry about that. That middle third of the memoir is definitely the slowest and definitely the least structured in terms of events. So yes, if you're covering that timeline and you're focusing on Agatha, you need to kind of create a bit of a plot. But it resembles that third of the memoir so little. There are, I think, about two little moments in the whole movie that are directly out of the book and I'm going, somebody did read the book! But other than that, no. In this storyline, Maria arrives because Agatha's taken over as mother after her mother died. So it's not because they need a governess or, like in the anime and real life, 
little Murray and needed a tutor. It's because Agatha's trying to be the mother and... For 16. Say it with me, everybody. Going on 17. So, on that note, let's talk about her love interest. Ziggy is 1% less fictional than Rolf. Ziggy was her friend when they were little before her mother died. And they meet up again several years later when he comes back to Salzburg and romance, sort of. Nothing like that happened in reality. There was a boy she was very close to growing up and they did meet up again in Salzburg many years later, but that was like a one-time thing. It was very much, hey, didn't know you were here, haven't seen you for a while, good to see you. And that's it. And his name wasn't Ziggy. That is the only thing I think makes Ziggy less fictional than Rolf. We did get to see a tiny tiny bit of what happened before Agatha died, and this time by Agatha I mean the captain's first wife. You can see why Rhodes and Hammerstein felt the need to change all the kids' names. And that is where we first meet Ziggy. But that also makes me wonder why the movie followed the timeline that it did. I think it would have been really cool to see everything that happened before Maria arrived. If the story is going to be focusing on one of the kids, why not do that anyway? The middle third of the memoir, which is the timeline this film covers, is definitely the slowest. The first third is about what happened before Maria arrived, and that could have made a really interesting movie, I think. Not that I don't like this one, I do. Come on. It's about the one traps, I mean. But I think it could have been really interesting to do a different story. What happened before Maria arrived? A bit more detail on what happened after they got to America. Yeah, there's the trap family in America, but I haven't seen that one because subtitles. It just makes me wonder why they tell a story covering the same timeline that all the other adaptations cover, but is entirely fictional because we're focusing on a different character. A story like that would have been really interesting to see. It's different from any other version. And unlike what we got, I think it would probably be closer to the truth. As I said, before I saw it, I thought part of it would be set in America. So maybe I've been bashing this thing for the past few minutes, going on about how it's not historically accurate, and yet, in a way, I think it's the closest to the truth. And I do. Maybe it isn't, but when I watch the movie, I get the feeling that it's, in a lot of ways, the closest. To reality because despite the fictional story that takes centre stage what's going on in the background is very very close to the truth. I'm pretty sure they were filming this in Salzburg the week before I was there. Maybe it was the week after but yeah I think they were filming in Salzburg the week before or the week after I was visiting there. So if you haven't seen the movie go out and watch it. I still very much recommend it despite the level of fictionalization that eclipses Sound of Music, and the fact that we are focusing on a different character, and as such our beloved Maria isn't quite as sympathetic in this version. And that's everything I've got for you today guys, I hope you enjoyed. Feel free to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in my video next week. So long, farewell!